Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Are we doing? Um, How are you? Good. Do you have Marcy's number? Are we ready? Is it Marcy's number? No, it's mine. It's my cell phone, so I just want to make sure. No wonder. I keep blowing. Hang yeah. on. Let me get success. Edit. Roberta, this is Paul. At She's at 415. Just one. 297. 297. 2459. That's what I got. Hi, this is Roberta. Hi, Roberta. It's Susan. Um, are you and Easter re ready? And Gina? I believe so. We're just upgrading a few more people to panelists, okay. I think. Well, you let me know when you guys are ready and we can begin. Thank you. And Roberta, Paul Piazza at Sonoma Water just wanted to check in with you regarding Paul Selsky and Katie Ruby. Uh, email from Paul indicates he's joined the meeting and will you be making him a speaker at the agenda point of the meeting or at this time? Yes, I see both of them logged in and we will be upgrading both of them to panelists and then upgrade Paul to a co-host so he can share his screen for that item. Great, thank you. I, I also noticed that Jack is out in the attendees, Jack Ding. Do we need to upgrade him? Okay. Yes, we'll take care of that right now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Jack. Hi, this is Roberta. We also have a couple of um, phone call uh, listed, uh, phone numbers listed, uh, both area code 415, one ending in 9821, and one in 1581. Could you identify who those people are, please? Yeah, this is Gary Anderson with the Red Water District on the 1581. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. And I see a hand raised for the phone number 9821. Can you unmute and speak to us? Uh, sorry, it took me a minute to figure out how to unmute. This is Danielle McPherson with the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency at the 9821 number. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chair Harvey, I think we're ready to go. All right, thank you so much, Roberta and uh, Gina and Easter. We can't do any of this without you guys, so really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the special WAC TAC meeting for um, this Monday, September 13th. Um, we will um, do a roll call and I would ask that the members state their name and the city that they're with. And I wanna remind folks to mute their phones if they're not speaking and the attendees um, Easter will take care of, of muting those and unmuting those. So with that, may I please have a roll call? Sorry, City of Katati. Here, Susan Harvey, City of Katati. City of Petaluma. Uh, here, Mike Healy, Petaluma. City of Roner Park. Here, Willie Linares, City of Roner Park. City of Santa Rosa. Here, Tom Schwedhelm, City of Santa Rosa. City of Sonoma. Here, Jack Dean. North Marin Water District. Present, Jack Baker. Town of Windsor. 
Sam Salmon, Town of Windsor. Valley of the Moon Water District. John Foreman, Valley of the Moon Water District. Marin Municipal Water District. Here, Jack Gibson, Marin Municipal. Uh, now the TAC members, City of Katati. Craig Scott, uh, City of Katati. City of Petaluma. City of Rohnert Park. Mary Grace Pawson, City of Rohnert Park. City of Santa Rosa. Jennifer Burke, Santa Rosa Water. City of Sonoma. Colleen Ferguson, City of Sonoma. North Marin Water District. Drew McIntyre, North Marin Water District. Town of Windsor. Christina Goulart, Town of Windsor. Valley of the Moon Water District. Matt Holner, Valley of the Moon Water District. Marin Municipal Water District. And we also have additional public attendees. Uh, let's see. Jim Grossi, Peter Martin, Paul Piazza, Pam Jean, Barry Dugan, Tony Williams, uh, G. Anderson, Jay Jaspers, Katie Ruby, Paul Selsky, Grant Davis, Claire Nordley, Dale Roberts, Jake Spalding, Larry Russell, Danielle McPherson, David Rabbit, Armin Munavar, and let me just take a quick Chelsea Thompson. We have Brad, Leif Sherwood, Michael Thompson, Mike Ilmarini, Sebastian Birch, Shannon Kotula, Stephen Hancock, Susan Hayden. <clears throat> Roberta, this is Drew. Could you yeah. could you bring Mike L. Marini in from an attendee uh, to a panelist? He's he's now the TAC representative for um, City of Petaluma. Yes, I'm promoting him right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that catch, Drew. So, are we ready to move on to the next item? Next item is public comments. Um, we're now taking public comment on non-agenda items. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via phone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Um, Secretary Ledesma, um, do we have, I'm not seeing any raised hands. Now is the opportunity if you would like to raise your hand. I'm not seeing any raised hands either. Okay, great. So, um, Drew, did you uh, receive any written or verbal comments? Chair Harvey, I did not. Okay, then with that, since there's no public comment, we will bring it back and we will move on to item three. Um, everyone I'm sure has had an opportunity to um, read the August 2nd WAC and TAC meeting minutes. Are there any questions or comments on those meeting minutes? Please raise your hand. Not seeing anybody jumping up and down, raising their hand. So now we'll take um, public comment on the me meeting minutes from August 2nd. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via phone, please dial star nine to make a comment on the minutes. Secretary Ledesma, I'm not seeing any hands, are you? I am not seeing any hands raised. Okay, since there are no comments on that, I would um, bring it back to the board and ask for um, a motion. First, Marin, uh, move approval. Thank you for that. Do we have a second? Valley. Second. <laughs> Looks like there was a race. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a motion and a second. Could I ask um, for a roll call vote, please? Yes. City of Katati? Yes. City of Petaluma? Yes. City of Roner Park? Yes. City of Santa Rosa? Aye. City of Sonoma? Aye. 
North Marin Water District. Aye. Town of Windsor. Yes. Valley of the Moon Water District. Yes. Okay, looks like we have a unanimous approval of that. So we can move forward and move on to item four, which is to approve the update of the 2014 water shortage allocation methodology. And I believe that, um, Drew, are you going to comment on this? Or yes, uh, thank you, Chair Harvey. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick this off, and then there will be a presentation by Sonoma, Sonoma County Water Agency consultants Brown and Caldwell. I believe it'll uh, both Paul Selsky and KT uh, will be uh, kind of providing an overview presentation on on the model and you know, what the changes are. But before they start, I just want to remind uh, the WAC members that uh, back in April. Uh, we had a special WAC meeting and, and there was an update um, on the history of the water shortage allocation um, going back to 2007. Just recall the restructured agreement was signed in 2006 and in the restructured agreement, uh, there they had some um, section there that essentially indicated that, you know, there needed to be a water shortage allocation methodology in place. And the restructured agreement identified uh, some of the uh, provisions that the allocation methodology needed to include. Um, the agency developed an allocation model um, back in 2007, and that was used for a couple of years. And then in 2010, the agency and the tax started working on an update to the allocation methodology, recognizing that the one that the agency was using right out of the gate um, had some areas that could be improved. And so fast forward from 2010 to 2014, over that uh, three to four year period, the agency and the TAC members worked on developing uh, an update to the allocation methodology, and it was called the 2014 allocation methodology. And the WAC unanimously approved that methodology uh, in 2014. However, it did have a sunset date uh, of two years to allow some more time to uh, address some concerns that were being raised on uh, the human health need calculation, essentially the indoor water use calculation. Um, concerns were raised that uh, it should not it should not include the commercial industrial institution demands. That's you'll hear me call those a CII. Um, and unfortunately, during that two year period, uh, we did not have enough time to go back and address this issue about the CII. And that's been worked on now um, this year, the, the first half of the year, this year on a, on a uh, full court press, if you will. Uh, and what the WAC members have in front of them essentially is the 2014 allocation methodology with some miscellaneous updates, uh, primarily to address the CII question uh, that was raised and, and the intent here is to get unanimous, unanimous approval of this allocation methodology and that is required by the restructured agreement. And if it's unanimously approved by the WAC members, then it can be uh, presented to the agency and the agency can adopt it. And then we essentially have um, an updated allocation methodology that's that's uh, new and improved over the one that the water contractor, uh, not the water contractors, the one that Sonoma County Water Agency has been using uh, since 2007. So with that sort of as the preface then, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Paul. Paul, are you gonna kick this off and then Katie or is, is it the other way around? I'm yeah, gonna... I can say just a 
I'm sorry. There's two Pauls. Are you talking to Paul Selsky, Drew? Uh, which, which, whichever Paul is appropriate to, to start this presentation. Yeah, I'm happy to turn it right over to our consultants at Brown Caldwell. I just want to recognize uh, all of the work by the contractors to help us with this update, which got underway uh, in collaboration with the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan. So we have a professional services agreement in place with Brown Caldwell, um, who did the work uh, to update the model in 2014 as well. Um, so thank you all for your um, assistance in getting the data needed to update the model and for all of the collaborative work uh, that went into the approach for this current um, iteration. So with that, I just want to introduce Paul Selsky and Katie Ruby at Brown Caldwell. They'll be co-presenting um, and to go ahead and take it over, Paul. Okay, and Katie's going to be putting up the slides and I'll be uh, starting off the presentation. Yeah, and I actually don't have screen sharing ability at the moment. Is anyone able to make me a co-host? Roberta, can we make that happen? <laughs> yes, ju yes, just give me one moment. Thank, Thank you me. so much. Ms. Ruby, you should have permission. Now. Yes, I see it. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you. Okay, so I'll um, start it off. Uh, good morning. So we're here to give you an overview of the water shortage allocation model methodology update. And we're going to cover a little bit of background, the status of the model, the um, the allocation approach, which has two main steps, the human health sanitation and fire flows and the reasonable requirements, and then we'll wrap up with next steps. A little bit on the background, and you heard a little bit about this from Drew, but in 2006, the original annual shortage allocation model was developed based on the restructured agreement. And that was a model that was developed, by the way, by John Olaf Nelson, who I believe was a past general manager of Marin Municipal Water District. And it's in, just to be clear, it's intended for shortages caused by in the river shortage conditions. It doesn't address disruptions of the transmission system, the aqueduct system. And in 2014, uh, there was a resolution adopted to uh, update the model. So the annual model was expanded to include a monthly allocation methodology, and it was put into an Excel-based spreadsheet that you know, any of us could use and share. And then in 2021, additional refinements were made in coordination with the Technical Advisory Committee, and that's what you'll be hearing a little bit about. Okay, so the status is that the model um, was approved uh, by the WAC um, to be used through 2016, but it was never adopted by the Sonoma Water Board of Directors. And one outstanding question back in 2014 to 2016 was how the model handles commercial, industrial, and institutional demands, known as CII. So this 2021 model had some modifications done to address the CII uh, issue and some other questions. And we collaborated with the TAC ad hoc committee to make these adjustments to the model. So this formula gives you the basic approach to the alloc how the allocation works based on how section 3.5 of the restructured agreement describes how it should work. And the, the everybody's allocation, each contractor's allocation is the is their their human health need for Sonoma water. And if there's any additional supply available from Sonoma water above the total of everybody's human health need, that is then allocated and added to the health need based on every contractor's entitlement share divided by the total delivery entitlements. And the reasonable requirement is also capped uh, is the maximum uh, allocation uh, that can be provided uh, through this allocation methodology. And you'll hear a little bit more about that. 
So again, the two key parameters are the human health sanitation and fire flows, and that's the base allocation. And uh, we're considering CII separately now on how that's calculated. And then reasonable requirement is the maximum, it's the cap, the maximum allocation. And one adjustment we've made is that it does not exceed the average three-year use for the previous three years, which is supposed to represent a normal supply. Uh, one nuance is Marin Municipal Water District per a separate agreement is capped at 4 million gallons a day supply for the May to September period of every year. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Katie Ruby to take you into some of the additional details on these items. Great. Thanks, Paul. And good morning, everyone. Um, so given that the, the human health need and the reasonable requirement are those two key elements that Paul touched on, um, we're going to dig into each of those in a little bit more detail to show how they are determined in the model and to highlight uh, those key changes that we've made in this latest update. And to start, we're going to look at some language from the restructured agreement, which includes some key definitions and really uh, kind of serves as the basis for the allocation methodology. So to start with the human health need, the restructured agreement notes that uh, the human health need shall take into account the hardening of demand. And demand hardening um, essentially reflects that for those customers who have made significant progress in conservation, it can be harder uh, to have additional uh, cutbacks in demands during a shortage. Um, the human health need shall be based on uh, winter water use by all of the water contractors. And then the restructured agreement does allow, uh, if necessary or appropriate, for equitable purposes to consider the commercial, industrial, and institutional water use separately. So that's that CII uh, consideration we've been talking about. So to show how this kind of plays out in the model, we are using three-year average indoor water use for each contractor based on January and February water use, since the restructure agreement calls to you know, look at winter demand. And then um, we've broken out the CII portion separately um, and only applied the demand hardening adjustment to the non-CII portion of water use, which is essentially residential water use. Um, the indoor, or sorry, the human health need also includes fire flow and transmission system losses in the total, which were not included in that original 2006 model. And then um, we subtract off the local supplies for each contractor to get to uh, the allocation from Sonoma Water. And the local supplies, uh, we're currently using 100% of anticipated uh, local supplies per, as provided by each contractor. The model does have flexibility to also use a percentage of three-year average local supplies. So back in 2014, that's what was used. We looked at three-year average uh, kind of historical data with a provision that those local supply numbers could be updated as information becomes available. So as we've noted, one key change to the human health need this time around is considering CII water use separately. And this slide, uh, you know, presents the differences between the three different versions of the models if you want to dig into the calculations further. But essentially, um, the main thing here is we're applying a demand hardening adjustment only to the non-CII portion of indoor water use, um, which is essentially residential water use. And the purpose for this is to avoid uh, penalizing customers who have high CII water demand, which would increase the indoor winter water use. And so the way the demand hardening adjustment is applied is essentially contractors with indoor residential per capita water use below the regional average get a boost, so a little bump to their human health need. And contractors with high indoor residential water use are brought, their human health need is brought down to the regional average. Um, and again, I've noted this time around in 2021, we're subtracting off 100% of the projected local supplies available. So now to pivot and uh, talk about the reasonable requirements. As a reminder, the reasonable requirement serves as the cap on any customer's allocation. And really the intent of the reasonable requirement is to ensure that no customer receives more water during a shortage than they reasonably need. The restructured agreement um, says that the agency may take into account demand hardening and determining the reasonable requirement, but it's not required like it is for the human health need. 
Um, but really the intent is to encourage water conservation and local supplies. So how this plays out in the model is we're looking at three-year average total water use for each contractor, and that's it. So the reasonable requirement is capped at three-year total water use. Uh, there's no more demand hardening adjustment in this latest model update. Um, similar to the human health need, Sonoma water transmission system losses are included in the total, and then we subtract off the local supply numbers to determine and the reasonable requirement for Sonoma water supply. And again, if you want to dig into the calculations, here's some more detail on the three different uh, models. But really, the only change here is um, capping the reasonable requirement at that three-year average total water use, which essentially removes the demand hardening adjustment. And the reason we did this is because uh, the demand hardening adjustment, which was included in the previous model, actually bumped up some contractors' allocations above their actual water use from the past couple of years. And based on the intent of the restructured agreement, um, you know, it's not reasonable during a shortage event to have more supply than uh, one would use on average. So that's why we made that change in, in collaboration with the TAC. The slide summarizes uh, the, the different elements of the three versions of the model. Really, there are a lot of similarities between them, um, but some of the key differences that you know we've touched on today are that fire flow and transmission system losses were not included in the original model, but we've since added those in. Um, the other main change is how we are uh, separately considering CII water use and the human health needs, so focusing the demand hardening adjustment on that non-CII portion. We are capping the demand hardening, or sorry, capping the reasonable requirement at the three-year average uh, use of supplies, so essentially removing the demand hardening adjustment there. And then the last change is how we're considering local supplies. So again, there's flexibility in the model on how this is done, um, but this time around we've looked at the actual local supply numbers that are available rather than considering some percentage of past local supplies. So here's a little bit of about the model itself. Um, you can see a screenshot here of the interface, but essentially it's an Excel-based model. There are several different tabs, starting with um, some instructions and definitions. And then there's a tab for the annual model and the monthly time step model with the ability to uh, input the total supply available from Sonoma Water and, and provide the percentage of local supplies to be considered. And then there are individual tabs for each customer where the uh, population and, and water use data is input. So with that, uh, that concludes our, our presentation. And uh, Paul and I are happy to take any questions or comments that may arise. And then the next step is to consider approval of the updated methodology. So, thank you. Thank you for that, Katie and Paul. And Paul. The two Pauls and the Katie. Yeah. So with that, um, do any of the Wacker Tech members have any questions? Easter, I'm not seeing any hands, are you? I am not seeing any hands raised. Okay, then um, if there are no questions from the WAC and TAC, um, I will um, open this item for public comment. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via phone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. And... Easter, I'm not seeing any public hands being raised. I am not either. You are not either. Okay. Then we will close public comment on this item and bring it back. Um, Drew, did you receive any written or verbal comments on this item? Chair Harvey, I did not. You did not. Okay. 
then if there are no questions, I appreciate all the work that's gone into this. Um, I know it wasn't easy. I know we've been working on this for a few years and all the work that um, the TAC has done and all the work that the consultants have done and everyone um, getting us to this point. So with that, um, I would um, entertain a motion. I don't want to remove approval. Clerk Marin, a second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Easter and Gina and Roberta, did you get the first and second? Yes, Mr. Healy and Mr. Baker. Perfect. Then um, I would ask for a roll call vote on this item. City of Katati? Yes. City of Petaluma? Yes. City of Roanoke Park? Yes. City of Santa Rosa? Aye. City of Sonoma? Aye. North Marin Water District? Aye. Town of Windsor? Yes. Valley of the Moon Water District? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. It looks like we have a new methodology. And again, thanks to all for getting us to this point. Um, I know it was not without um, struggles. So appreciate everybody cooperating and getting us there. So with that, um, we can move on to item five, the Sonoma County Water Agency Climate Adaption Plan draft. And I believe that Dale Roberts is going to present this to us. Uh, hi, this is Dale Roberts. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Oh, okay. Um, do you want me to share? Can I share my screen? Am I able to do that? I would believe that that could be possible, right, Roberta? <laughs> yes, you should be able to share your screen now. Okay. Um, uh, could I, before you start, um, it looks like Jay has his hand up. Jay Jaspers, can we see what Jay needs? Jay, you uh -oh. are able to talk. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was, um going to kick this item off. That was it. Sure. Oh, perfect. Go for it. All right. Um, good morning, um, WAC members, uh, Jay Jaspers uh, from Sonoma Water, and um, just wanted to kick off this uh, presentation with Dale Roberts, who's our project manager uh, for this climate adaptation plan. Um, and also acknowledge Jacobs Engineering, especially uh, Armin Munavar um, and his team um, for the hard work that um, they've been engaged in over the last few years in, in uh, helping us develop this uh, comprehensive climate adaptation plan. Um, we've presented this to the TAC a couple times in the past um, with updates on the process and um, <clears throat> where um, planning to take this plan to our board for approval on October 19th. And so, um, Dale, are you running the slides? I believe yes, we I gave him permission to yeah, do Can that. you see the slide deck? Everybody? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. okay. Where is that bridge, Dale? Uh, which bridge is that? Is that, um, Don, is that, that's not Hacienda, is it? That's, um, uh, I'm not recognizing it, but boy, I wish we had water like that. <laughs> yeah. that was, you'll get it again and it won't be fun. <laughs> Aspirational. <Thanks>. Okay. <laughs> uh, so um, anyway, our, our climate, uh, water, Sonoma Waters Climate Adaptation Plan um, really recognizes that in our region in the North Bay, um, in Sonoma County for sure has experienced a significant amount of um, climate driven impacts uh, and will continue to do so in the past. We, uh, we don't, we all know that we have an extreme uh, high level of variability uh, in our climate and certainly um, the climate forecast for the global climate models uh, indicate that uh, these climate drivers are going to become more significant and in 
what the, our climate adaptation plan uh, attempts to do. It's very comprehensive in covering all of our business operations uh, from flood control, sanitation, our administrative uh, functions, and notably our water transmission, water supply enterprises. We're gonna focus today on that ladder uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that you are aware that our, our climate adaptation plan is comprehensive for all of our business operations. Next slide. And okay, this slide is uh, shows um, uh, a report that a published uh, paper that came out um, in 2018 from Tom Coringham that evaluated the proportion of economic losses due to atmospheric rivers and uh, for the 11 Western states. And it looked at um, the damages, recurrent flood damages for FEMA uh, for on a county by county basis. Uh, go back one slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and what I wanna show here is that uh, close to 99, 98% of the damages uh, for flood uh, in Sonoma County in our region were due to these atmospheric river events, which you've heard us talk about before. Uh, and then the table in the lower right shows that over the last 40 years, um, Sonoma County's uh, suffered $5.2 billion uh, of damages um, due to recurrent flood uh, damages. And um, that is the highest of any county in the 11 Western states. The second uh, county uh, for damages is Los Angeles County. So Sonoma County uh, definitely um, is impacted greatly by these atmospheric river events or flooding. And then also, as we've known the last two years, when we don't have these events, uh, we um, go to straight to droughts and significant droughts at that. Next slide. This just shows, of course, what we all know, the wildfires and some of the most significant wildfires and fires um, in California uh, have occurred in our region, in the North Bay region. And this just illustrates that. Next slide. Sonoma uh, Water has several ongoing efforts uh, focused on climate adaptation. Um, there, we have partnered with a lot of um, research and academic institutions and federal agencies uh, to better understand uh, the latest in um, climate science. And so that we are well-versed and can take in the latest information, the latest tools that are available uh, into our operations and our operational models uh, so that we can be as prepared as possible and utilize and take advantage of of the most recent advances in science. Some projects that we um, have been involved with, we've talked about forecast and flow and reservoir operations, which really can provide uh, water supply benefits and flood control benefits by using this information, uh, uh, this latest science and tools in how we and the Corps of Engineers operate our reservoirs. Uh, advanced quantitative precipitation information is another a partnership uh, that we help lead um, with partners uh, from uh, several of the major Bay Area uh, water management and water utilities uh, to better um, forecast the near-term um, forecasting for atmospheric rivers to help prepare ourselves for uh, flooding that uh, is caused by these atmospheric rivers. Our fire camera alert system, we initiated that in the North Bay uh, to help us um, more proactively manage and, and really for uh, first responders and, fi and fire um, uh, agencies such as CAL FIRE to, to have better information to support situational awareness and logistical uh, support. Uh, and we have several other, if, uh, other projects here. I'll just point out the Water Supply Resiliency Study, which is a collaboration with our water contractors uh, that we're actively engaged in. Um, and that focuses on um, water shortages in our regional system from Potter Valley down to uh, basically Sausalito and really looks at uh, developing a model to apply stress tests, water shortage stress tests, either through seismic events or through drought. Uh, and then 
are uh, really examining and working together to see if there are any projects we can do to build resiliency against those shortages. We are very active now, again, with Jacobs uh, and Armin and his team, uh, with all the water contractors in um, implementing uh, this study, uh, pushing forward the drought scenarios and setting aside right now the earthquake scenarios uh, for later, uh, given the uh, current circumstances. So anyway, this just gives you an idea of some of the pro projects and programs we're involved with to build our climate uh, resiliency. Next slide. Again, this is uh, our climate adaptation plan covers our water transmission, wastewater and flood uh, uh, enterprises. And uh, there are several areas of overlap. In other words, where we really look to seek um, solutions and adaptation programs that can help um, multiple areas of our, our business enterprises. For example, flood control and water supply, if we can recharge some of that winter water uh, that will help with flood control, but it will also um, help us with the water supply aspects. And recycled water, using more recycled water, uh, not only helps the sanitation resiliency, but it also uh, helps from water supply too, of course. Next slide. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, these are some of our uh, projected climate and hydrologic changes for the region and our climate adaptation plan goes into some detail on the latest studies uh, and modeling for this. Uh, and I, we all know that the temperature is forecasted uh, to increase here and everywhere. Um, and that has its uh, certainly its local impacts in terms of water use and uh, wildfire impacts, sea level rise, of course, um, uh, will impact us both on the San Pablo Bay, but also on the, uh, the Pacific Ocean uh, coast also, especially out by Jenner. Um, precipitation uh, is variable. And um, when you look at regionally, uh, some areas um, may experience drier conditions in the future and some will be wetter. Um, our, our region, it's it's a bit of a mixed bag depending on what the um, climate models you look at. But what the climate models are consistent is that uh, we will have increased variability. That means we will have um, increased precipitation intensity and likely higher flood intensity. And we, at the same time, will have uh, higher recurrence and intensity of droughts. And the reason for that is because these atmospheric rivers, uh, the, all of the, uh, the climate models predict that these atmospheric rivers um, will play a greater role uh, in our future climate, um, either by uh, their presence or lack thereof, which then produce you know, the droughts and the flooding uh, impacts and, and uh, risks that we will face uh, and continue to face into the future for our uh, our facilities and our operations. And of course, wildfire, uh, again, with a temperature, increased temperature and in increased drier conditions during periods of the future, we've already uh, all are well versed in, in that um, hazard and threat that we face here. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Dale to finish out the uh, presentation. Uh, Thank you, thanks Jay. everyone. Thanks, I'm Dale Roberts with the Sonoma County Water Agency. Thanks everyone for being here today. Um, I'll get through the rest of these um, so we can get to any questions you may have. Uh, Jay talked about uh, the various climate threats, uh, the increases in temperature, sea level rise, the variability in precipitation and, and the likes. And so we paired those in a vulnerability assessment across each of our core functions of water supply, flood management and sanitation, which is the old school term for wastewater. Um, and looked at how each of those parameters would impact uh, each of those uh, core functions of ours. Um, and then of course, uh, vulnerability is the sensitivity of that climate threat times how well that system can adapt to it. But in addition to that, we also looked at a deeper dive at the risk assessment and then what is the consequence of that climate threat and time and the risk being the, the the product of the consequence times the likelihood of it and can you do something about it at that point which leads to the next uh step um which was looking at each of our systems and, and we did this a table similar to this or an assessment similar to this 
uh, for all of our water supply, flood control, and sanitation system. These are sort of the major systems, how we broke down our whole water supply uh, system. Most of you have seen uh, some of these facilities. They're, they may even be near you, uh, Mirabelle and Wollor. I think you've all been to. If you haven't, uh, we'll take you there. You need to see it. Um, uh, and our chlorination systems and, and our booster pump systems down the road and, and way up in the upper water supply in the um, Lake Sonoma and uh, Lake Mendocino and looked at based uh, the uh, vulnerabilities and risks of all those systems. And you can see each of the uh, impacts, the temperature rises, sea level rise isn't too bad on the water system, on our sanitation system, our flood management system, sea level rise is a different issue. But as far as water supply goes, um, uh, that's not a big impact uh, water supply wise. Extreme precipitation, you can see river flooding and of course drought, uh, um, we're, we're all living that right now. So we looked at across all of our systems, even uh, booster stations and the like. Um, then we sort of categorized uh, all, all of those after developing adaptation strategies, categorized them into different groups and grouped them together. We had 70 some odd uh, strategies for, for each of the water supply, flood management and sanitation systems. Uh, Circumstantially, they, each of those core functions neatly uh, divided into five um, uh, overarching uh, strategies, um, uh, action strategies for water supply, for the water supply infrastructure, increase operational flexibility, improve the system integration and regional resilience, improve watershed and natural resources management, and continue to advance science and technology as it relates to the water supply system. Um, and I'll, we'll, we'll go into detail in some of these um, a little later. Um, but I want to point out in the lower left there, you can see regional water supply strategies. That's the resiliency study that uh, Jay was mentioning earlier. You heard reports of that uh, in uh, at some of these uh, water advisory committee meetings and technical advisory committee meetings. Um, and over on the, on the right in the pie that's roughly 2 to uh, 4 p.m., uh, we'll say, uh, the forecast inform reservoir operation ways to change how you operate, not just what do you build, but how do you change how you operate. And so we have been working with Army Corps uh, to change how we operate the releases of uh, uh, flows from each uh, uh, historically Lake Mendocino, but more recently uh, Lake Sonoma. Um, and outside of our own systems, where uh, some of these concepts, as Jay was talking about, span not just our different core functions, but expand beyond just what our systems are. We don't control the whole watershed, but just about every drop of water that lands in the watershed and even in the upper eel watershed, uh, we, we want to, uh, has influence on, uh, on how we operate our systems. So, uh, we need to integrate across uh, different sectors and we need to collaborate with other entities. Uh, these are some of the um, uh, adaptation concepts that uh, uh, span more than just what we can control and they re require collaboration with others uh, or they require collaboration amongst those different uh, enterprises between water, flood control and uh, uh, sanitation. Um, and with that, uh, uh, what, what we were going to say earlier was um, that uh, the schedule now is we're going to our board on October 19th with the final climate adaptation plan for approval. And uh, you can see uh, the emails of Jay, myself, and Armin of Jacobs Engineering uh, if you have any questions. Uh, so with that, uh, Chair... Harvey or Drew, I'll go back to you guys and see if you have any questions. But let me first see if Grant or Jay want to add anything at this point. No, Dale, I think you, did a, you and Jay have done a good job. I'd be interested in the feedback from the WAC and the TAC. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that. Um, any questions from the WAC or TAC? Questions, comments, please? Raise your hand so we can hear them. Everybody's pretty quiet today. <laughs> um, I'm not seeing any hands. Chair Harvey. Yes. This is oh, there's your hand. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I do. I do have a couple quick questions. Uh, thanks, Jay and Dale, for the presentation. But first, first question I have is: is having this climate adaptation plan does that uh, set the agency up for in a in a better place as it relates to just any future grant funding for for projects that might come out of this? Yes, Drew. That's one of the um, key advantages we see of having this plan and being one of the first uh, water agencies uh, to develop a comprehensive plan. Uh, so that's very much in our thinking um, and our intended use of this plan. Okay, thanks, Jay. And then uh, my second question just had relates to forecast informed reservoir operations. So the agency has made great strides with Lake Mendocino and getting approvals to um, operate in the flood storage zone could, stage. Could you, Jay, could you again just briefly summarize um, how you're planning on lever leveraging the, the earlier work for Lake Mendocino into work on Lake Sonoma? Sure. Um, as you pointed out, uh, the first FIRO project, it was really developed, the, the, the strategy was developed um, here at Lake, Sino at Lake Mendocino, and it's proven to be a great success. And um, based on that, the Army Corps of Engineers is now currently and actively implementing um, FIRO at Lake Mendocino and its water control manual. This is the first of its kind by the Corps or anywhere. And what we're doing is now we're leveraging um, that effort and then the tools and the science that we collectively worked on with the core and uh, NOAA and Scripps and DWR and the, the whole team was behind this. It wasn't just the core and Sonoma Water and the whole team of the federal and state agencies in Sonoma Water are now moving over that same steering committee and we're initiating a, a FIRO program to evaluate the viability at Lake Sonoma um, and we'll be able to leverage um, a lot of the great work that was done for Mendocino. So we're pretty excited about that. Hey, thank you, Jay. Chair Harvey, those are my questions. Great. I, I mean, the, the presentation for me, it, it just, you know, people think, you know, they turn on their tap and they have water and they appreciate that, but it's just always so amazing to see just really all the bits and pieces and how they kind of dance and walk and talk together to be able to bring that um, to customers. It, it's just always amazing uh, to me to, to see just really how complicated and how um, uh, intricate things are and you know you tug on one string over here and it affects another string over here and you guys just um do a really good job of uh pointing that out and um kind of really showing us the big picture um it looks like david you would like to um add something i just want to add tag on to what you were saying there uh madam chair in terms of the the work of the agency and and grateful for that jay I had my uh, Seismic Safety Commission meeting this week, and we had Neil Driscoll uh, from oh. UC San Diego. He said a big thank you and a hello to you. Uh, Sonoma County really leading the way on fire cameras. Um, and it was interesting. It, they came out of, originally, the Seismic Safety Commission as locations for earthquake early warning systems. And it turned out it was easier after a major fires to get funding for fire cameras than it was for the earthquake monitors, but you could easily add the earthquake monitors to the fire camera locations. Uh, but um, Neil uh, spoke very highly uh, of Sonoma County's in, uh, innovative approach on these kind of things. And uh, I think, uh, you know, as you know, I'm a big fan of uh, FIRO. Uh, I, I do think that's going to be the response to this drought period. Uh, just like Lake Sonoma was uh, to our last drought of record. So here's to uh, continuing that work as we go forward and staying ahead of the curve as much as possible in these very uh, uh, turbulent times. So thank you for all the work. Thank you, David. Uh, any other, I'm not seeing any other hands. Yeah, you know, it's it always, it always amazes me the, um, 
uh, living and, and being part of Sonoma County uh, on water, on, on all of the different things, um, how well we as a county and all of the representatives of all the different cities and the county, we really work very well together as a region. I'm always very proud of that because um, I think it does show leadership how we can, you know, take a problem and all work together uh, to solve it for our area. So with that, um, I will see if there's any uh, public comment on this item. If you wish to make a public comment, either raise your hand. If you're dialing in, please dial star nine. And now would be your time to comment or ask questions on this item. Gee, the audience is also very quiet today. <laughs> I am not seeing any hands. Are you? Mr. Mr. Harvey? Yes. If, if we don't have public comment, we are uh, fortunate enough to have the prime consultant from Jacobs Engineering Mm -hmm. at our Water Advisory Committee, Technical Advisory Committee meeting day, Armin Munavar, who's been leading this effort. And I think the question that Drew asked us earlier really is telling about how does this set up uh, Sonoma Water and our contractors vis-a-vis -vis the state investments portfolio. Um, Armin also has been doing a lot of leadership work with Department of Water Resources in their water plan update. I'm just wondering if Armin's still on the line, if he might just share a little bit about this, the significance of the work product and also pledge to you that uh, we'll stay on track because time is of the essence. So I'm putting them on the spot as well, that we're going to our board with this on the 19th of October following Director Rabbit. So Armin, could you both confirm we're gonna get this to our board? And secondly, provide uh, your insights as to where we are vis-a-vis -vis the state process for investment portfolios. There is Armin and he is now allowed to speak. Great. Yeah, thanks. Well, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so as um, as Jay and Dale um, summarized very well, we have a draft of the plan that is in review right now, and we're looking forward to pushing that over the end line um, in the coming weeks here to get to final. So absolutely, we'll be getting that to the board and look forward to, to comment, review, and hopefully subsequent approval of that plan. The plan does go into quite a bit of detail in terms of uh, individual adaptation strategies and risks and really hope that that's useful for for uh, the overall board and this group to, to look at how how you can make the systems more resilient in the future. On the second part, Grant, your question of kind of uh, how the state is moving, I can only give you my sense where we are doing some work with the state at the at Department of Water Resources level and, and resilience is the name of the game for for the state and anything we can do for Sonoma water to get them ahead of, uh, or the county to get ahead of the, the game in terms of establishing resilience planning and resilience strategies that are already um, well thought out, aligned, um, concept level feasibility assessments. Um, the state is really looking forward to moving those towards action. And I, and I know the kind of the recent uh, windfall budget has been pushed towards resiliency and at large part resiliency and, and wildfire resilience. So uh, there's quite a bit of uh, opportunity for funding. And I think this plan sets up the, the county quite well to, to attract that funding or go after that funding. Thank you, Armin. That's kind of what I was hoping. Your leadership on this is much appreciated as well as Jay and Dale and their team. I know we wanted to get this to the WAC. It's very important that you have an opportunity to chime in and provide feedback before we go to the board. So just very, very pleased that we're this far along and we're actually gonna get it done this fall. So thank you. Thanks, Grant. Jay, did you um, have anything further to say before we move on? Just wanted to give you the last <laughs> chance. Thank you, Chair Harvey. Uh, no, just thank you for your attention and support through this process and the climate adaptation plan, you know, like many of these plans is gonna be adaptive and of course, and uh, it's gonna be um, something we'll be updating periodically as, uh, you know, to stay current with uh, the circumstances as they present themselves. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. And thank you for all the hard work that all of you have done to get this. 
So with that, I will bring it back. Um, I, I think I have a technical question here, Drew, before I do this. Or is the intention that um, the WAC members stay on or jump off this call? <laughs> Yeah, this is this is where you have an option. Uh, you essentially will recess the the special right. WAC meeting, and mm -hmm. and so the WAC members are are certainly welcome to continue. But if they have other commitments, because this was a special meeting that was set up, um, we understand that, and uh, so we will continue this uh, as a t as a TAC meeting, uh, moving forward with the other agenda items. Okay, so with that, WAC members, you have heard that you may stay on or you may jump off. And with that, um, thank you, everyone. I know that this was hard fitting in everyone's schedule. Appreciate um, everyone being here. And I will turn it over to you, Drew. Thank you. Thank you to all the WAC members and uh, Chair Harvey um, for your participation as well. So we're gonna we're gonna move now with the remaining agenda uh, as just part of the technical advisory committee. So we're now at agenda item six, which is water supply conditions and temporary urgency change order update. And Don Seymour with the agency is gonna provide that uh, update. Don, good morning, Drew. Good morning, everybody with the TAC and remaining members of the WAC and the public. Um, starting with uh, Lake Mendocino. Current storage is about 17,400 acre feet. This is quite a bit below the 20,000 acre foot goal we had had starting October 1. Um, it's, storage is pretty concerning right now. Uh, the current release from the reservoir is 89 cubic feet per second. And uh, since our the last uh, meeting in early August, the reservoir has declined about 7,500 acre feet. Um, we're currently um, about 4,000 acre feet below that threshold, uh, the storage threshold goals we had set for, the, for, the, for today. And uh, we're currently on track to be below 15,000 acre feet on October 1. So like I said, this is very concerning. Um, with regards to, uh, just wanna bring up the emergency regulation and everybody's aware that uh, curtailments were issued by the state board, both for the Upper Russian River and the Lower Russian River, selected water rights on the Lower Russian River, all water rights on the Upper Russian River. There have been um, inspections by state board enforcement. Um, Sonoma Waters facilities were actually inspected uh, uh, um, a week or so ago, um, and that included uh, um, Town of Windsor, who is a point of diversion on our water rights. Um, those inspections uh, are currently going on in both Sonoma and Mendocino County, um, and they're, they're, they're scheduled to continue through the, the end of the month. So um, um, there's information posted on the state board's webpage on, 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 on those inspections. Uh, for Lake Sonoma, the current storage is, um, is about 113,000 acre feet, and the release is 98 uh, cubic feet per second. And since our last TAC, uh, TAC WAC meeting, uh, storage has declined about 9,300 acre feet. Um, the reservoir is forecasted to drop below um, 100,000 acre feet early to mid November. So um, starting to see um, some, you know, getting some, we're getting to very low storage in, uh, compared to where we, we've ever been before at Lake, Son uh, at Lake Sonoma. Um, five day running average at the Healdsburg gauge has been 26 cubic feet per second. The current flow rate is about 25. Um, to kind of put this in perspective uh, on how low this is, um, the lowest, the flow has been this time of year at the Healdsburg gauge has, uh, was in 2015, um, and it was about 50, 55 cubic feet per second. So this is significantly lower than what was, what was even experienced in 76, 77. Um, the Upper Russian River is, 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 is the lowest it's ever been in uh, over the 81 uh, years of history for, for that Healdsburg gauge. Um, the Hacienda, at the Hacienda Bridge gauge, uh, the five-day running average has been 34 cubic feet per second, and the current flow rate is uh, 36 cubic feet per second. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Don. Uh, any questions on Don's update from the WAC or the TAC?
don't see any don on the on the releases that you reported the 89 cfs uh, uh, for lake mendocino and the 98 for lake sonoma are those do those change much from i mean from last week or how do how do they vary over the last week or couple weeks so um when the curtailments were issued, um, they, they went out August 2nd for the Upper Russian River and August 10th for the Lower Russian River. Um, in response, we did see um, um, some reductions in, in reach losses. Uh, I think we were releasing about 115 CFS at that time. And over about a two week period, we were able to reduce the releases to about 85 CFS. However, we saw uh, and, and it stayed it stayed that way for from like mid mid August till about um, a week ago. Drew, we were seeing pretty pretty you know steady flows in the river. Um, about ten days ago, we started seeing declines again, and we had to make a release change last week for an additional five CFS. So we went from we went from about eighty two up to eighty nine, um, but it has been fairly steady. On the Lower Russian River, we had been releasing about 84, 85 CFS for almost the entire month of August and, and the first week of September. Last week, we did have to make a release change of five CFS uh, to increase releases. And I think we were, really what was driving that is the, is the completion of the uh, of replacement of the inflatable dam and then in filling the dam and trying, you know, it's uh, trying to speed that process up is uh you know not wanting to choke issues of choking you know choking the river off and and, and having trouble meeting minimum stream flow requirements down at the bridge hopefully we'll be able to uh, cut that back but we'll have to wait and see okay thanks don and then with respect to your uh field inspections by state water board staff was is there anything anything you can share there any any comments of uh, of notes at all that that were raised? Questions that were raised? No, it was very. It was pretty uneventful. It, the team was actually led by a, um, a, a state board staff who had actually been in the Russian River Permitting Division for a long time, who had transferred to enforcement. So he knew our facilities really well, and he kind of had the same question we the Sonoma Water staff did: Why are Why are you selecting Sonoma Water when you know? And, um, you know, for, for an inspection, it seemed like uh, that wasn't going to be provide them with much information. Um, it was like I said, they just visited um, several of the um, points of diversion and, and uh, some of our meter facilities. Um, basically, we were selected. Uh, th th their selection process really was heavily weighted on the size of the water right. So obviously, Sonoma water with having the largest water right in in the Russian River was was put on that list. Um, the only other thing I would mention is I'm not sure really how if, other than you know water right holders knowing that there's state board staff in the field um, based on what they in, you know what they were looking at. I really don't know how that's going to um, support enforcement of those curtailments. You know, really the information they collected, I'm not sure, other than having their presence, I'm not sure how it's going to help get folks in line that may not be in full compliance with with the curtailment. Um, Pam was at the, uh, the inspection part of the time. I don't know if you want to add anything, Pam? Um, no, not really, Don. Um, it, it was, like Don said, the fact that the sort of team leader for our group that came out um, was familiar with our facilities and us, um, I think helped. Um, I, I hope that the fact that the enforcement teams are out through it throughout the watershed, there's several of these teams out right now. Um, I'm hoping that that will um, get some people to, to do what they're supposed to be doing, which is not be diverting water. Um, if they're not municipal or, or residential users. So we'll see though, um, it really just depends on how seriously people take it. 
Yeah, I would just add. I would just add to that that you know, if you do the math, we're releasing 89 out of the reservoir. We're barely at 25 at Healdsburg, so you know we're seeing a loss of 65 cubic feet per second on the Upper Russian River, which is indicating that there's there there are some people that are not complying. All right, thanks, Don and Pam. Any other questions from the WAC or the TAC before? Let's see, Matt, I see you have a raise hand. Yeah, hey, um, thank you. Um, and Don, thank you for the presentation. Um, you know, given the, the sort of dire <laughs> nature of this thing and uh, with folks not complying and everything like that, is there an estimate currently on how much longer we have any kind of usable storage in Mendocino? So, you know, the you know what what type of hydrology we're going to see in the coming months is, as you, as you know, there's just a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Um, if we were to see a repeat of you know, let's say a, a dry year like 2015 or 2021, um, Lake Mendocino could go dry by by February. Um, that's that's absolutely in the realm of possibility. Which as a you know. Um, uh, a, a water resource manager is is pretty frightening to me. It's that, that there's even that possible, you know, that type of risk is out there. Um, so, uh, and certainly by December, if we have dry conditions, the reservoir could be down below 10,000 acre feet. So, um, just one thing to add that I think um, um, is, is is an important point is um, the Army Corps actually has funding to do um, bathymetry surveys this year at both Lake Sonoma, Lake Mendocino. This is really good news for Lake Sonoma because it's never been done since uh, Warm Springs Dam was constructed. So it'll give us a, a really good understanding of what type of sedimentation has occurred and, and, and lost storage. Um, so they're going to be doing LIDAR on in the uninundated areas and then using a you know vessel mounted technology for the areas that are still submerged. Um, the last survey that was done for Lake Mendocino was 2001. So um, there's definitely been sedimentation since um, since then. And um, based on estimates of previous bathymetric surveys that have been conducted, we estimate um, the sedimentation rate to be about 130 to 140 uh, acre feet per year. So um, it'll be. Um, It'll be really good information to understand. It, you know, when I, when I previously mentioned we have 17,500 acre feet, we'll get a better understanding how accurate that number really is. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions from the WAC or TAC before we open it up to the public? I don't see any. Um, all right, now if uh, anybody from the public, again, this is agenda item number six, water supply conditions and temporary emergency change order update. Uh, if you'd like to uh, make a comment, please raise your hand via Zoom or dial star nine on your phone. Drew, we do have two raised hands. Um, Peter Martin, I'll allow you to talk. You can go first, please. Yeah, uh, thanks for um, letting me ask a question. Uh, thank you for the update, Don. I was just curious, um, in terms of watching what uh, pg and is doing with their existing variants, um, is there any expected potential small amount of relief that could occur perhaps in October? Or I mean, I know that kind of that threshold of the 36,000 acre feet uh, for the existing variants is probably not going to be reached anytime soon, but I was just curious if you could explain. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Peter. Good morning. Um, yeah, so PGE is is uh, managing the Potter Valley project under um, a variance that um, FERC uh, approved. Um, they, they had done temporary improvements. Uh, appro they approved it temporarily uh, twice, and then a final approval went, uh, was issued in August. And um, no, they're, they are going to be strictly, pg and has made it pretty clear in a, in a number of meetings, they are going to be strictly managing to that variance um, uh, at, until it expires either uh, through hitting that 36,000 acre foot uh, threshold um, after October. 
Um, that, that, that has come up at a couple meetings and they've been pretty clear that they're gonna strictly be managing to that variance. Um, I think one point to, to make here, make is we actually have seen um, transfers from the project a bit higher, uh, inflows into Lake Mendocino from the project a bit higher than, than we had projected. Um, however, um, on um, starting October 15th, those, those transfers are gonna significantly reduce um, uh, the transfer to the uh, Potter Valley Irrigation District drops from 25 down to five CFS, and the minimum stream flow requirement in the East Branch drops from the current five down to three, and they'll also cut the buffer of five CFS they've been putting on it. So the transfer is gonna go from about 30 CFS uh, to um, eight CFS starting um, October 15th. So it's actually gonna go in the opposite direction. Great, thank you. Easter, were there other comments? Yes. Public? We have a raise hand from David Keller. You have been unmuted. Hi, thank you. And, and thanks for the updates, uh, Don. I truly appreciate it. Um, just for folks' perspective, um, and it's part of the FERC variance for the Potter Valley Irrigation District, they are still irrigating about a thousand acres of hay. This is their second cropping. And so in terms of where water is being used coming out of um, uh, Scott Dam uh, and Lake Pillsbury and where it's being used at PVID, this is the imbalance, shall we say, in a drought year um, that has been achieved through that variance, the thousand acres. They did say that they would not be doing third cropping, um, but it's kind of crazy that this has been allowed. Um, so just for your perspective on that, thank you. Thanks, David. Easter. Were there any other public comments? I do not see any other raised hands. Okay. And let the record reflect that there were no um, comments um, generated over the weekend via <clears throat> phone or email to me. So we're gonna to move to agenda item number seven, Sonoma Marin Saving Water Partnership. This is broken up into three different uh, uh, subsets here, 7A is water production and uh, it's relative to what we have historically done, the 2013 benchmark. Uh, the, the graph also shows just the gallons per day per capita since the late 1990s. Uh, you can see here in July water use um, versus the 2013 is down 26%. Um, and we have a new tracking that we've added and we'll continue to do so during these uh, order re uh, reductions and diversions. Uh, if you can scroll down further, it shows uh, the reduction in Russian River diversions. Keep scrolling down, please. Uh, next page, <clears throat> a little bit more. Yeah, right there. Uh, so the agency is tracking this and it's actually available on their website and is updated um, on a weekly basis and it shows uh, that, the, you know, the order is to reduce uh, Russian River diversions by 20% um, starting July 1 and you can see here through the early September, uh, it's about 22%. Um, so we're, we're meeting and exceeding that diversion requirement through the state water board and that'll continue to be updated and reported out uh, as this order continues for reduction in diversions. Um, any questions from the WAC or TAC on this? I don't see any questions, any hands being raised on that. I'll open it up to the public. And again, this is agenda item 7A. Any questions from the public? I 
I am not seeing any raised hands, Drew. Okay, thank you, Easter. And let the meeting minutes reflect that I did not receive any uh, voicemails or emails earlier regarding agenda item 7A. So we're gonna move now to item 7B, and it's just an update from Paul Piazza on the order term nine reporting. Paul? Great, <clears throat> thank you, Drew. Morning, everybody. Um, so if you recall the temporary agency change petition and the subsequent state board order from February included a water conservation term, term nine, that uh, stipulated uh, monthly water conservation reports um, be submitted to the state board for the term of the order. Um, I've reported on five previous monthly reports having been submitted. Uh, there was a final uh, due at the end of August, and it's um, of note that we've received clarification um, somewhat recently that uh, when the new state board was issued in June, if um, any of the, the previous terms were not carried over, that those terms were revoked, and so it was clarified that no final report was required for this uh, term of the order. Uh, just to give you uh, an update, though, um, you know, the contractors have done a great job of providing all their data uh, on a monthly basis during a very busy time for their staff, uh, including this final report. So I reported back in um, the beginning of August that we'd achieved over 14 million in savings for the five months uh, during that previous term. It should be noted that that estimate of savings is really only attributable to those conservation measures that are um, easily calculated in terms of savings. So uh, those types of things would include toilet installs, uh, the drought kits that have been given away to install shower heads and faucet aerators, and, and other things that are easily quantifiable. Obviously, uh, the graph that Drew just showed where we're meeting close to a 22% reduction uh, far uh, exceeds that amount of savings during the time period. Um, and then um, because I did receive the reports from the contractors for this final uh, report, um, you know, we're closer to 19 million over the six month term of the order, just for those measures that have been implemented by the partners that are quantifiable. So. Uh, it just speaks to all of the ongoing effort of all of the agencies and the partnership and the continual um, um, participation by our customers and many of the programs that help build savings, not only during uh, this drought year, but in the years to come. Uh, the aggregated annual savings, uh, just from the measures implemented this summer, um, totals well over 30 million gallons annually. So. I uh, just want to emphasize that and uh, to mention finally that, uh, again, this wraps up the monthly conservation reports that were a requirement of the previous uh, state board order. Thank you, Paul. Any questions from the WAC or TAC on Paul's update? Seeing none, we'll open this up to the public. If you wish to uh, make a comment, please raise your hand via Zoom or dial star nine on your phone. There are not any raised hands. Okay, thank you, Easter, and let the meeting minutes uh, reflect that there were no pre-recorded public comments uh, received by me over the weekend. So we are going to move now to agenda item 7C, drought outreach messaging, and this is tag team by uh, Barry Dugan and Paul Piazza. Thank you, Drew. Barry Dugan with Community and Government Affairs. Um, good morning, members of the TAC and remaining members of the WAC. I'm gonna share my screen right now and uh, hopefully everybody can see it. We can. Thank you, Drew. Uh, so this is our public outreach update. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that this presentation is the first and only to include a pet. Um, so uh, we did have great participation in our second um, drought drive drought drop by event, and this was a photo taken in um, Sonoma, I believe. Uh, so as as you mentioned, Drew, Paul, and I will be um, tag teaming on this. Um, on this presentation, and I'm going to try and advance my slide. 
so just a quick summary of, of what we're going to tell you. Uh, we had a successful drop, drop by event um, last month. Um, we conducted a successful saving water challenge um, during July and August. Uh, we have an ongoing bilingual social media and advertising campaign that will continue through the duration of this drought. And uh, we have a new partnership website design uh, that Paul will be talking about. And then finally, the Trusted Messenger video project that uh, we have unveiled on behalf of the partnership. So I'll let Paul talk to you about the drop, drop by event. Great, thank you, Barry. So uh, similar to the first event that occurred in June, we held a second event on August 21st at 13 locations throughout the Free County area. Uh, we were able to give out an additional 3,300 plus kits overall amongst those 13 locations. Um, that included uh, both devices to actually um, save water such as shower heads, faucet aerators and self-closing hose nozzles, but also uh, information and tips on additional ways to uh, reduce your water use and information about the various programs of the partner agencies. As you can see in the lower left photo, uh, the kit was packaged up in a bucket that enables customers to use warm up water or water in the kitchen sink that catches rinse water for cleaning vegetables and fruit that then could be repurposed in the household to water plants, uh, both in, so inside or outside uh, the home. Um, there is uh, a third event uh, scheduled for October 9th. The October 9th event uh, is a much limited event in scope. City of Santa Rosa is partnered in that and we'll be doing some outreach on behalf of that October 9th event. And uh, the partners that committed to purchase additional materials and wish to participate again in that October 9th event uh, will be putting uh, information about the final locations for the October 9th up on the partnerships uh, website soon. But a great effort again on October 21st, um, had a lot of good turnout and a lot of information shared uh, and we're hopeful that um, that will build some additional savings throughout the summer. So jumping right into the Saving Water Challenge, uh, we held a challenge through July and August that included uh, a pretty complete list of tips and ways for people to save water. Uh, those uh, customers that we're willing to pledge to take the challenge and sign up on the partnerships website. We're made eligible uh, for a list of prizes that you can see here, including a high efficiency clothes washer, high efficiency toilet, irrigation controller and the like. Um, that challenge did wrap up at the end of August and we have a preliminary selection of winners that we are circulating around with now to identify um, we have uh, a little bit of time to do that, um, just given we have uh, only email contacts and we give people 10 business days to uh, respond. So hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to publicize the final contest winners of the challenge. Thank next. you, Paul. Yep. Uh, so just a quick update on our, our bilingual drop messaging. You can see there, there's uh, one ad in English, one in Spanish. Uh, these have been published both in print, uh, print media, digital advertising, and throughout social media. And uh, just want to also reiterate that this is a partnership-wide effort. So we've gotten input from all of the partner partnership members and done it, they've done a tremendous job of uh, supporting this effort and distributing these on, on their own as well. Um, we're doing a, a slight refresh on the drop messaging. Uh, this is being spearheaded uh, by Sonoma Water and Santa Rosa Water. Um, and you can see that the message is the same. Uh, the, the, the color color scheme is the same, but there's a slight slight refresh on the design. Uh, we're in the process of developing some uh, new messages, some new ads uh, with a little bit of levity, and we'll report on that uh, at our next the next TAC meeting. But uh, again, intended just to to keep keep the message 
consistent to keep the message present, um, keep repeating the message because we know that's what's uh, needed to to continue to change behavior in terms of water use. Um, and now I'll let Paul talk to you about the new partnership website. Yeah, this is a project that's been going on for roughly the last year. We had a few setbacks during the, the COVID time, but uh, recently we were able to launch this new website live. So I encourage you all to visit savingwaterpartnership.org. Um, we have a couple new features on the partnership website, uh, including a water smart plant picker. So uh, previously we used to contract with a third party provider to provide um, a database for those interested in information about low water use plants. The new website uh, has now built that in as a feature and we're relying on um, the Sonoma County Master Gardeners superstars list essentially as the uh, the launch list and we'll be uh, continuing to build out that uh, plant database over time. Uh, we also have a new tool that enables folks to um, get information on appropriate irrigation scheduling. Uh, the tool is hooked up to the California Irrigation Management and Information System, which relies on real-time daily weather updates to change those scheduling recommendations. Uh, it works two ways, either to provide um, a weekly runtime for your irrigation based on some user in, or user um, information about the type of irrigation that you have at your home, whether it's overhead sprays versus drip, whether you have high water use plants or low, uh, that schedule can be customized in terms of your weekly runtime. And then there's a second option for the tool, recognizing that a lot of controllers these days have a budgeting feature, which allows um, customers to set their timer to meet the peak summer demand in terms of minutes and then make seasonal adjustments to weather based on raising or lowering by a percentage uh, the, the amount of time your controller actually implements. And so we do have um, that feature built into the scheduling tool as well. It's a watering index that simply provides easy information on a weekly basis on how to adjust your irrigation budget on a percent basis, either down or, or up if we're in a, a brief period of hot weather. Um, so that's great. Uh, the website, of course, uh, is a regional tool that we're gonna be continued to build out over time. Um, we did build in um, to the programs feature a pretty comprehensive list of all the partnership programs for each of our agencies. So people can essentially visit the website and utilize it as a one-stop shop uh, to determine what programs are available to them and they can be redirected then to their local utility for additional information or signups for programs. So visit the website, um, we're excited. Um, it's got a, a great new look and a lot of new features for people and we're hoping to build that out over time. Um, really quickly too, I also just wanna give a nod to the Russian River Watershed Association as another a great website to visit during this drought time. Um, all of the Sonoma County partners uh, in the partnership are also RRWA members and did a lot of work with RWA to, to quickly build out a drought resources page. So um, if you're unfamiliar, you can uh, visit um, the Russian River Watershed website, which is rrwatershed.org. Uh, on their homepage, they have a pretty clear link to their 20, 2021 drought updates page. And it has a great uh, resource to be able to quickly take a look at all of the um, cities in the watershed uh, and shows what particular reduction goal they've implemented, whether it's mandatory or voluntary, uh, and then links to each of the partnerships uh, and RWA members pages for additional drought information and resources. So thank you, Barry, go ahead. Thanks, Paul. And finally, just wanted to uh, give you an update on our trusted messenger video project. This is a project again launched by uh, uh, the partnership and had participation from a number of the partners. And this is short videos about water saving tips from different members of the community, including the Daily Axe in Petaluma, um, the Cousteau Bakery in Sonoma, I mean, sorry, in Healdsburg, um, uh, um, 
Gardner uh, Landscape, True, True North Landscaping. Uh, it's throughout Sonoma County. And these are in English and in Spanish. We have, uh, again, participation from all sectors of our community and from a lot of the partners. Uh, so that's all we have, Drew, for the partnership outreach update. And we're happy to answer any questions. I have a question. I saw those, the drought is here t-shirts. Are those available? Those were available, uh, John, to uh, participants in the drought drop by event. So those were, those are for staff members and um, other, other people who worked at the event. We, we have the, uh, the graphic files available if you'd like us to share them with your agency for, for further print runs with a, a shirt company. Thank you. And John, I'd either, or John, I'd even throw mine over to you if you, if you'd really like one. I've, I've used up my use of it for the season. <laughs> People that know me know I love t-shirts with messages. Drew, I think you're muted. I am muted. Uh, yeah, John, I was saying that I think Paul's going to take care of you there on that um, shirt request. Paul's a good man. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, did you have a question, comment? Yes. Um, thanks, Drew. And thank you, Barry and Paul, for the presentation. Um, and uh, thank you for letting folks know about the October 9th drought drop by. I know for Santa Rosa at the last drought drop by, we gave away 1300 kits. And at the first one, we gave away 1500 kits. And so just, I know it's intense and a lot of work, but would highly encourage as many of the contractors as possible to do another drought drop by event on October 9th. I think they really are a great way to get the word out to our community. Um, I did have a question in relation to, um, messaging and kind of where we're going for the fall. Um, I'm, I'm getting a little concerned about um, water usage in September and October in particular, uh, because we see the allocations drop quite a bit. And um, I know that we typically see a lot of waste uh, in terms of irrigation. Typically a lot of people over irrigate in the fall. Um, is there any way that we can get messaging out currently and focusing really on encouraging people to cut back um, immediately on irrigation and really try and point them to the tools that are available, not only through the partnership website with the water budgeting um, information, but I know a lot of the retailers, I think, also have similar recommendations on our website. I know Santa Rosa, we have as well. Uh, weekly watering recommendations. So can you just talk a little bit about what the focus is in the next couple of weeks and if there's a way that we can really get messaging out about reducing irrigation immediately? Sure, Jennifer. I know uh, Barry and I had had a conversation previously about kind of next steps for some of the radio ads and uh, what you bring up was actually one of the topics of discussion for focus of that. Uh, I think all of the partners would echo that during the fall months when the days are getting shorter and the ETO uh, is lowering, uh, even though the weather remains warm, people don't seem to understand that by late August, you can cut irrigation you know, by as much as 30 and 40% by the end of September. So we are talking about uh, refocusing the outdoor savings information to be about the recognition of uh, lowering irrigation requirement. I know many of the partners already have very uh, severe irrigation restrictions, at least particularly for city of Hillsburg uh, and Marin. So um, I'm not sure how they're gonna cut back significantly, but for others, uh, there's always people that are still kind of business as usual, even during the drought. And so um, even if you know people have reduced significantly, there's always a, a good message to get out for those that aren't quite um, understanding or doing their part that, this is the time of year where you've got to be making cut that backs to irrigation. And then secondarily, we haven't had any significant rain yet, but there's going to be a point early in the winter or late fall 
when we get that first um, you know bit of rain that um, we're going to be messaging to remind people that you've got to be attentive to your automated irrigation system and make sure that's being turned off um, during those rain events because um, on a scaled up basis that's going to be able to provide a significant reduction in use uh, during the critical period of this order when um, more and more will be focused on how to meet the reduction from indoor. Um, so yeah, that's kind of one of the, the points we're touching on. And Barry, if you have other thoughts, and then we've talked a little bit about refocusing on indoor water saving options, but. No, I think you hit on it, Paul. We, we, we are aware of that, Jennifer, and are, you know, focusing the, the latest messaging on actually turn you know turning off your irrigation a little sooner than you normally would you know as a simplified message so great thank you i just think the sooner we can start pushing that through social media and other things even this week uh would be helpful thank you thanks jennifer any other questions from the tac or WAC on this item again this is agenda item 7c drought outreach messaging Hey, Paul, um, has anybody thought about maybe doing some sort of giveaway on the water catchers that shut off the um, uh, smart water meters or the smart water irrigation systems, I should say? Uh, are you referring to rain shutoff devices for smart controllers? Yes. Uh, we haven't thought about a, a giveaway. I think there's a lot of variability in the type of controllers that might be installed out there. And each of the manufacturers tend to have uh, a different type of product that um, kind of goes with their specific controller. So um, I think it's a great idea, John, if, if nothing else, getting the word out to the community that those devices are uh, existing and, and not expensive to install so that um, it helps with getting the system turned off during those rain events rather than rely on people having to take the time and go out and manually shut it off. So um, that might be another great opportunity to do for the, the fall outreach messaging, both in terms of um, highlighting the advances in irrigation controller technology and also um, the devices that are out there to help turn them off during those intermittent rainfall events. Thank you. Any other questions from the TAC or WAC? Okay, I don't see it. We're going to go ahead and open this up to the public. If you'd like to comment, again, we're on agenda item 7C. If you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, please raise your hand um, via Zoom or dial star nine on your phone. I do not see any raised hands. Okay, thank you, Easter, and let the meeting minutes reflect that there were no pre-recorded public comments on this agenda item as well. So we're going to move now to agenda item number eight, biological opinion status update, and Pam Jean is going to provide that for us. Morning, Drew, and everybody else who's attending the meeting this morning. Can you hear me okay, Drew? Yes. Okay. Um, we uh, have a few updates for the biological opinion. I, I won't spend a lot of time on this and I'll just try to hit the highlights and as, as we've had updates really regularly with this group. So um, I'm looking at the, the um, document that is currently on your screen, we'll start off with the fish flow project. Um, there really is no big changes with regards to this at this point. This is the project that we're looking at changing in stream flows um, in the Russian River in accordance with biological opinion and also to address the issues that we have with changes in the Potter Valley project. Um, so this is ongoing work um, and uh, continues to, to move forward at this point. Uh, the next item down on the screen, the Dry Creek Habitat Enhancement work. We are working on two um, pieces of the phase two, three projects this summer. Um, we expect that those they'll be completed with that work by the um, mid-October timeframe, which is when they need to be out of the creek in accordance with our permits for construction. Um, they just recently um, finished some grading and habitat feature installation on the west side of the creek. Um, 
as part of this project and um, a backwater feature there. Um, they've got approximately 75% of the ex uh, excavation done for the side of the channel, for the side channel where the water will actually flow through that side channel on the east side of the creek. Um, I was actually out at the project um, about a month ago now, very interesting, and there's a lot of dirt being moved around. So it's very um, a very big project actually um, that's going on out there. And again, they do expect to have that work completed um, and be out of the stream by the October 15th deadline. So that's the last remaining pieces of the phase three project elements um, for this year. Um, habitat monitoring and maintenance, the next item down the screen here. Um, our environment, we've talked about this quite a bit, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but our environmental staff does continue to conduct physical and biological surveys on projects that have already been constructed. So the idea is to go out there and make sure that they uh, meet the requirements that are required um, by the biological opinion, as well as identify maintenance needs for those projects. So that work is, is ongoing and um, will continue uh, in the future on both the completed projects, the currently completed projects, as well as any project that gets completed in the future. Um, we also um, were out, did um, some site visits downstream of the West Side Road Bridge. Um, this is an area where we had a lot of sedimentation during the 2019 high flows um, in Dry Creek, and um, they are developing conceptual designs for maintaining the features down there. And the, that work will likely occur in 2022. Um, and um, there's also some work um, in terms of minor sediment removal and maintenance of some vegetation for phases one and two of the project that will also happen in 2022. So that's what's going on there. Um, we also continue to work with um, property owners, um, both for phase, um, well, it's really uh, all three of the next three phases, four, uh, four five, and six. Um, the bid documents have been completed for phase four. Um, and it will be the first phase that will be constructed by the Corps of Engineers. Um, there were, I, I think we've talked about this before, but there were changes requested by the property owners in the right of way agreements. Those changes have been shared with the Corps of Engineers. We got some preliminary input back from them, um, but not, um, not final input back from them. So this project has the space for work will not be completed this year. It has been delayed to next year. And uh, hopefully we can get these right of way issues worked out with the core. Um, ESA, our, our consultants, ESA and Cardno have completed the 99% design submittals for phases five and six. And construction of phase five would be in 2023. Construction of phase six would be in 2024. Um, they're working um, on appraisals as well as um, negotiations with property owners for both these phases at this at this time and continue to advance the right of way agreements um, out there. Um, we, of course, may get the same type of requests from these property owners that we got from the phase four property owners um, in terms of changes to the right of way agreements. So we'll have to work our way through that uh, if, if, in fact, that that happens. So um, the last piece about Dry Creek is that there is some what I'll call extra work being done um, by ESA uh, working on um, a piece, uh, a habitat enhancement piece. It's, they've got a 30% design package um, for a site that's upstream of a phase three site. Um, and we're doing this um, in case we need some extra mileage, I'll call it, um, to fully meet the six miles required by the biological opinion. Um, we're currently uh, meeting with property owners in the area, regu regulatory agencies to get their input um, after there was a design meeting should have been held last week. So that's uh, what's coming up next on that. 
And as far as fish monitoring goes, um, September 1 does mark the beginning of our underwater video system operation at the Mirabel Dam. So um, we, uh, my understanding is that the dam, that the, the camera is in place, it's operational at this point. Um, I heard just last Friday they're a little bit behind and um, looking at those videos, but they don't expect to actually see any Chinook at this point. So uh, that's probably okay. Um, they uh, are pretty concerned because of the drought about uh, what the Chinook migration uh, might look like this year. So um, they'll continue to work with the resource agencies to, to discuss this. And um, hopefully that information that we gather through the camera system will help in those discussions as we go along. Uh, the next item, the Russian River Estuary Management Project. Um, the estuary itself is open. And um, we continue to do uh, weekly pinniped monitoring out there, as well as water quality and biological uh, monitoring. Um, and the management season uh, ends in mid-October, so that's, that's the end of that, of that work um, for the year. Um, and there, there is, just so folks know, <clears throat> the water quality data that is being gathered as part of the, rest of the estuary management project is... Uh, as well as under the temporary emergency change petition order that we received from the state is all being um, posted weekly on our website. And the, the link is here if you want to take a look at that. Um, and in terms of interim flow changes, I think Dawn already covered that. So unless there's changes uh, or any questions on that, um, I won't cover that at this point. There's a nice photo of a... A tree that used to be underwater, no longer trees, coral under, used to be underwater, no longer underwater, like Sonoma a few weeks ago. With that, if, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions, Drew. Thanks, Pam. Uh, any questions, comments for Pam from the WAC or the TAC? Don't see any, Pam. One thing that one question that I had just related to the um, draft EIR is, is, do you have, you know, we've been talking about it recirculating uh, in 2021. If you have anything, do you know what month that might be? You heard any month mentioned? Yeah, I do not, Drew. Sorry, I don't have that information. And I don't believe, I looked for Dave and Jessica. I don't see them on. Um, on the meeting, sorry. Okay, all right. Uh, not seeing any other questions from the WAC or TAC. We'll open this up to public comment. Again, this is agenda item number eight, biological opinion status update. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand or dial star nine on your phone. I do not see any raised hands. Okay, thank you, Easter, and let the meeting minutes reflect that there are no pre-recorded public comments on this agenda item as well. And so uh, we're gonna move to Potter Valley Project relicensing update. And Pam, you have this one as well. Yep, okay. Um, so the, the sort of big news on the Potter Valley Project and the relicensing process that's going on there is that um, the partnership, um, those of us that we either refer to ourselves as the partners or the notice of intent um, parties, which is what the FERC refers to us as, um, <clears throat> we have a due date of tomorrow um, under the integrated licensing process. And um, instead of waiting till tomorrow to submit something, we actually filed a letter with FERC on September 2nd. Um, and in that letter, we asked FERC to allow us additional time um, to do some more work in terms of due diligence and studies and fundraising. Um, and we requested that um, additional time until May 31st of next year, um, at which time the partnership would provide further notice regarding um, what we're what we're doing at that point. Um, <clears throat> so the partnership requested the delay to provide um, time needed to answer a, a, 
a lot of questions, including, including um, some risk questions, ownership cost questions, as well as um, whether or not some restoration work uh, might be feasible and, and various other things. Um, and again, we will also um, be looking at seeking state and federal funding during that, that time frame that we've asked for through May 31st. Um, so I'm not sure exactly when we're going to get a response from FERC um, as our filing was due, as I said, tomorrow. Um, but I would expect at some time in the next month or so, we'll hear back from FERC about whether or not they're willing to grant us um, that um, extra time. Um, but um, that's where we're at right now. Um, there have been a couple of articles in um, Mendocino County papers, um, and um, the, the partnership uh, will probably be putting a press release out this week on that. So we can, there might be more articles showing up in the paper after that. That's it, Drew. Thanks, Pam. Questions from the WAC or TAC? Um, Potter Valley project update. Don't see any, so we'll open this up for public comments. If you wish to make a comment, please raise your hand via Zoom or dial star nine on your phone. We do have one hand raised, uh, David Keller. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. Great, thanks, Pam. Um, Pam or, <clears throat> or Grant, um, at this point, do you see any prospect for the funding, uh, either out of the state or any other sources necessary to do the studies to continue? I mean, that really seems to be the key point in being able to proceed as the partnership has intended. Uh, David, as you may know, we're actively working with Cal Trout and our colleagues to continue to pursue state funding and to support uh, the priority work that's got to get done. So uh, the legislature just adjourned, and uh, it's now time to dig through all the different drought provisions that were uh, incorporated. There's a lot of new money in there, so uh, that's an ongoing effort. And uh, your colleagues are, are definitely right in there with us seeking funding to support the effort. Yeah, we are we are uh, in an NOI agreement with Caltrad, so we are kept pretty well up to date on that. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you, David. Any any other public comments? I do not see any other hands raised. Thank you, Easter. Um, okay, we're getting towards the end here. We're at agenda item number 10, items for the next agenda. This will be a TAC meeting October 4th. So we'll have our regularly uh, scheduled agenda items. A couple other additional ones that, that I know of is, you know, since we're working on an allocation that goes through the end of October, we'll be uh, having something that looks at a, at a late fall allocation for the water contractors that would be starting in November. Um, so we'll most likely have an agenda item on that. We also should have an agenda item on just, um, you know, post December 11 uh, order planning. So just recall that this order expires on December 11th. And so we need to start talking about, you know, what, what, what do we anticipate will take place um, as we continue to move into uh, what could in fact be another dry year? We hope it won't be, but we need to plan accordingly. So we'll have at least those two additional agenda items. Does anybody else have anything uh, above and beyond what's just been discussed for the TAC meeting in October? Hey, Drew, before you adjourn, I just want to personally thank uh, Susan. Thanks for staying on and any WAC members, but I want to thank the TAC members for reaching agreement on the water shortage allocation methodology and Brown and Caldwell and folks. We're taking that to the board tomorrow in hopes that we were going to reach the uh, agreement today. So thanks for spending the extra time and energy to get that done. It's now updated and I'm personally appreciative. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Grant. Um, I yeah. would second that, Grant. You guys worked, I know, really hard and tirelessly to 
to make it work for everyone. And I really appreciate all the work you guys did. Yeah, it's, it's great to have a, a unanimous decision uh, by the full, full WAC voting. So absolutely appreciated by all. Okay, I'll open this up for the public comments. Uh, again, this is agenda items for the next meeting. If you'd like to make a comment, uh, raise your hand via Zoom or dial star nine on your phone. I do not see any raised hands. Okay, and there are no pre-recorded public comments on this agenda item. So that brings us to the end of the meeting, 11 a.m. Thanks everybody. Um, have a good week and look forward to the future WAC and TAG meetings and your participation. Take care. Thanks, Thank Gang. you, Drew. Take care. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.